Hi everyone, welcome back to the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. Thanks for joining us this Friday noontime for news and politics. We'd like to thank Ray Rickman and Rose Weaver for coming in. We'd like to thank my third and final guest, Neil Steinberg with the Rhode Island Foundation. Thank you for joining us thank today. Thank you, Kate. I appreciate it because I want to talk with you about this recently unveiled initiative that I'm sure has been a long time in the making. This is the Long-Term Education Planning Committee recently unveiled a 10-year plan to look at uh, education here in Rhode Island. Talk with us. Let's take that step back. It's been unveiled, but clearly this has been in the works for some time. Sure. So at the Rhode Island Foundation, you know, we're the largest funder to the nonprofits. We've been funding education. We've been leading uh, different initiatives in education for, for a long time. And it was clear that we just weren't making progress. And so, you know, skipping ahead when these scores came out, you know, I, I object when people say it's a wake up call. It's not, it's validation of what we've already known. So we knew that we needed improvement and this is, you know, pre-K through 12 education and wanted to, to look at it. And as we looked north to Massachusetts, um, we saw that one of the reasons for their success is that they started 25 years ago on a path and they stayed the course and looked on the long term. So what we wanted to do was instead of just the pop-up programs, the flavors of the moment, what's going on in the next six months, get the group together, look out where do we want to be, where does Rhode Island want to be in providing the best education we can for our students 10 years from now, then look at what are the top five or six things that we need to do big picture to get there, not a 250 page shelf document that I've got filling my, my drawers from over the decades, and, and then work backwards on what do we need to get to that. And so that's, that's the goal of this, and we put people together. Then the RICAS scores came out, and as I said, not a wake up call, they validated all this. So unfortunately, it's a good backdrop for this, but it, we had started talking about this knowing that that was coming in beforehand. And we've known, uh, again, these RICAS scores obviously show how far behind Rhode Island is uh, with neighboring states uh, mm -hmm. here in Rhode Island. But we've seen these performances before right. here between the park, between the kneecap. Um, right. We know the results here have not been mm -hmm. where they should be. But let's talk about this 10-year plan, Neil. Again, this if a kid's in eight years old right yeah, now, yeah, I mean, right. why? where's the, the urgency? Why does it need to be 10 years? Yeah, yeah. so uh, two things. First of all, we're not going to interfere with people that want to make improvements for that kid today. So we don't want to ignore the eight-year-old, we don't want to ignore the senior in high school. So the, the education system, the, the leaders have to do what they have to do. The reason is that we don't stay the course here. We change every time there's a new administration, every time there's a new commissioner, every time there's new leadership in the legislature. We change the direction and we've got to all get on the same page. What do we want to achieve? And so that's the, the goal of that. It's then to work backwards on what do you start doing in, in the meantime. When you talk to people, and we're working with uh, Dr. David Driscoll, um, I know Gary Sass is a frequent guest here. Gary was actually the one who introduced me to him. He was the Commissioner of Education in 1993 in Massachusetts who, with Governor Weld, implemented these changes. And he, if he were standing here, would say two things, high standards and stay the course. Go for the, the gusto, go for the top. Massachusetts in the past has benchmarked against Singapore, world-class education. We benchmark against Alabama. And I don't say that just as a wise guy. It's true. It's just raise our game. My goodness, you know, we've got a small state, and it's not as different from Massachusetts. We're not benchmarking against uh, and comparing right now and following Texas or California, big states. The unions are similar in Massachusetts. You know, we complain about the cities and towns. They've got plenty of cities and towns in Massachusetts. There's no reason that, that I know of other than Social and economic will has to overcome the political will. And so why can't, you know, you talk about Driscoll coming in, yep. having set that blueprint for Massachusetts. Right. Why can't we literally say, give us that blueprint. Yep. Tell us what you did. Because it's not the need to reinvent the wheel. Correct. Massachusetts has yeah. the wheel. Right. So why can't we say, tell us what we need to do this year that then can be implemented yep. so that it doesn't have to be protracted. So that 2020, we're doing identical to what Massachusetts yeah. did. And yeah, we know it took them 25 years, but again, it's like going up the right. street, seeing a beautiful house. You don't have to make that from scratch. There's a blueprint there. Why can't right. we grab that blueprint and run with it? Yeah, no, it's a great question and, and probably not as easy as it sounds. So he wrote a book um, uh, called Commitment and Common Sense Reform in Massachusetts about what they did. I read the book. I skipped to the back looking for the answer. <laughs> um, and he would be the first one to say, 
it is worth looking at the blueprint. It is worth picking what you can follow. They're the first ones to say they're not perfect. So they have achievement gaps. Okay? We've had the highest Latino achievement gap in the United States for the last five years. So they have achievement gaps, just theirs are up here and ours are down here. Mm. So they're not perfect. They have funding challenges and things. So what we want to do is study it, look at the, the, the playbook, and see what are the best parts, what are the parts that can work. And then he, he will say it takes a few years to implement them. So when they put in in 93 higher standards, they didn't see improvements in their test scores for a few years. Once they did, it's easy to stay the course if you're having success. And let's talk a little bit about the comparison again with Rhode Island and Mass. The, the per pupil expenditures are very similar. It's not that Rhode Islanders aren't putting their wallet into the education system here. So is there going to be a cost tag associated with this? And then you have Rhode Islanders and taxpayers saying, well, if we're each eighth or ninth of per pupil right. spending, why are we being asked to do more? Yeah. Does, can this be done within the construct of the existing yeah. funding structure? Mm -hmm. No, I, I, and, and I'm not sure. I mean, the, 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 the assumption by some is that it's a reallocation of existing dollars. That's easier said than done. I've been in business. It's not that easy. Uh, some will say we have to put more into the areas of need, like English language learners and things like that. I, I don't know. That's what this group's got to look at is what will it take to get from here to there. And it may take up a give up here. So what we're telling people who are on this committee is leave your stripes at the door, be positive and realistic. And I firmly believe in order to get 100% of something done, everybody's got to be willing to take 80%. You can't get everybody everything they want. That's what's happened. Everybody's polarized, goes to their corner. Um, the other thing is to put the pressure on and get input, we're going to have uh, public engagement session. So similar to the Together RI that we did early in the year, we went around the state on a listening tour, we will do some modified version of that so that parents, so that teachers, so that students can all get firsthand input into this. And you talk about, again, Driscoll, it's, I'm mm -hmm. thinking of thinking outside the box here. A lot of the stakeholders who are on this list are people who have been at the table yep. for the last 15, 20 right. years. Is that what's going to enable this to, again, that outside the box thinking because right. they've all sort of been banging their heads against the wall and here we are, we've seen the response in the RICAS scores. How yep. is this going to be different than what the stakeholders and status quo has yeah. been for the last 20 years? Yeah, it's the age old question. You know, so you, you wanna have the new thinking and the new people. Uh, they're the ones who are still in charge to make the change. And, and so, um, you know, you try and be a little more positive on this is a legacy issue. So if you've been doing this for 25 years, let's get it right and let's get the collective. And, you know, going around and talking to everybody individually, it's a little like Middle East shuttle diplomacy. Um, people want to do this. Even, even, you know, categories of, of groups that people think they're entrenched and they're the problem. Um, this is not a blame game. We all got there and we all watched it for the last 20 years, whoever the we is. And now it's, this is a point in time, and is it an opportunity? Will it be a missed opportunity? We're not doing this again another five years. So I'm gonna tell you that from the Rhode Island <laughs> Foundation point of view. So this is the time to take the shot. And you know, we saw the uh, response, we saw the scores and we saw the response. And didn't seem to see a lot of outrage from parents or families around. We did see with some of the lower performing communities. How much do we need that student family perspective in here as well? And for yeah. them to be part, not just of the conversation, but realizing the need and again, that sense that everyone needs to be right. able to participate to be able to bring the, the state mm -hmm. forward. Yeah, we, we need everybody to be up in arms. And I agree with you. I have been surprised that there has not been more outrage and whether people are saying, well, you know, it's not me, it's not my kids, mm. not my school, they're wrong, because it's all of them. Um, it's not that it's just good enough, because it's not, if people want to compete here and in, in, in the rest of the country and in the world. So we've got to do that. We've got to get out there and we've got to create that at all levels, leadership. But I agree with you, it's not seen the outrage that you would think that the statement was made that if Rhode Island were a district in Massachusetts, we would be in the bottom 10%. Yes. So everybody get off their high horse about how good they think we're doing or their school is doing on a comparable basis, we're not doing well. And if you saw the results for the broadcast and other tests as well, the high performing charter schools performed mm -hmm. incredibly high against mm -hmm. districts in Rhode Island. Lower performing charter schools were also at the bottom right. as well. Right. So the constant tug and pull between 
public charters and the regular public schools has been constant from that funding standpoint. Right. But when you clearly see some high performing charter schools outperform well performing districts, I mean, should it not be looked at that model and saying, you know, maybe this is what needs to be mm -hmm. replicated throughout the state. And we need to move beyond these territorial conversations between publics and, and public charters. Let's talk a little bit about that conundrum. Yeah, no, and, and, and you're right. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the term charter doesn't ensure success, right? There's good charters and there's ones that aren't as good. Uh, and you can't ignore the success, right? The scores at Achievement First are, are spectacular. So I think if we can agree on where we want to get to, and what the priorities are. And then when we get to how to do it, you gotta look at where the success has been. You gotta look at what it is. Uh, and again, I'm not the expert. Is it longer hours? Is it different teacher training? I mean, it's, it's never one little thing, but where can we collaborate? The, my understanding that the original model and purpose for charters were to be beta sites. They were to be labs and then take what they learned and communicate it to the rest of the, the public district schools. That has rarely happened. The learning community does it a little. Blackstone Valley Prep does it a little. But you would think people would be banging down the door saying, why are your scores 80% and my scores 30% and I'm just down the street? So yes, we've got to get that on the table. And one of the things that we had talked a little bit before but I really want to discuss too is again, those standards. We keep talking yeah. about test scores, but really those graduation requirements right. and what a diploma from Rhode Island means with these students moving out into the community, right. moving towards right. higher education opportunities. Because one of the things that we've seen is students going to the community college of Rhode mm -hmm. Island under the Rhode Island Promise Program, right. needing, as we've known, this remedial help to be mm -hmm. able to get through the program. But Massachusetts has those. Is this really where the political will needs to exist here in Rhode Island to say, there needs to be a standard of right. which that we are going to say, this is what needs to be met in order for you to get that diploma to move forward into the community. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably one of, if not the most important thing. And that's why I said the social will to be able to provide for people, the economic will to want an educated workforce has to overcome that political will to stay that course. Right now, I've heard stories about high schools in different communities where certain colleges and universities will not go to interview kids. So it's not that every diploma is the same. Yeah. People know that, that it is. Um, getting a diploma and then not being able to get a job because you can't pass the test, wrong. And, and so we've got to back up on that and see what are the fundamental things that that diploma means. But again, the stay the course is when somebody hears an anecdote or a story or you know some school has five kids, this, we've got to hold the ground and not find out. We should know in... I don't know, I'm not the, the expert, seventh or eighth grade, who's gonna have trouble graduating from high school? Not six months before they're not no. gonna get their diploma. <laughs> and again, I'm sure a lot of this is looking at that Massachusetts model because again, mm -hmm. we've seen their test scores right. rise to the degree that they have, but again, having those standards there. So how do you anticipate this? I mean, it's probably not fair to the student nor the school to say, tomorrow we're going to hold you to that same exacting Correct. standard of Massachusetts because as we see from those test scores, right. but how soon can we expect and, and sort of, I don't want to say demand, but yeah. hold accountable to say after year one, we need to see right. this. Are we going right. to see this sort of tier? Because everyone kind of sees that 10 years and again says, oh my gosh, that's 10 years. But as you said, that's not to preclude having advancements for year and year out. Right. But will we see from this committee to saying that there are going to be dedicated benchmarks that need to be met uh, from year one, two, three, moving forward. Yeah, I don't know. So, so you know, the first thing is where do we want to get to? Then what are the top priorities? I don't know what those are, so I don't know how long it takes to get to them. Okay. But we definitely have to make progress and put in place. You know, I always get intimidated by the school calendar. So if you haven't done it by now, you got to wait till next September, and then before you know it, it's two or three years. Same thing with the legislature. So we're trying to wrap this up in six months. This is not a two-year study committee or something. Um, we'll be done in, by the end of June and come out with what we can and then look at what it will take to do it. You know, one of the real outside the box things that's been discussed that really no other area has really done, but like a year round calendar. What a year round calendar, yeah. you know, is everything on the right. table here? Yeah, no, I think everything has to be on the table. You know, many people will say that education is one of the last of the dinosaurs, right? You get out of school at 2.30 to go work in the fields. You know, we, we have the summer off again for the agrarian economy that it was not built. You know, I've joked that, 
Uh, if, if somebody got frozen 50 years ago in time and we defrosted them now, they wouldn't know a cell phone, they wouldn't know an electric car, they wouldn't know anything. They'd p feel perfectly comfortable walking into the local school. And, it, and chances are it was the same one in Rhode Island and, look at, and, and it would look and feel the same way. So yeah, we've got to look at all the things. And the question is, is it new and out of the box or is it doing the basics better and holding to that? You know, I'm an old reading, writing, and arithmetic guy, and not to preclude uh, all the other things that could be done with technology and stuff, but we've got to get kids that can go out and get a job and read the manual and add up the figures and measure the cut and things like that. Anything else you want folks to know, Neil, while we have you in here again about this committee, as you said, yeah. six months looking to have that report out by the end of June. So if it's at the end of June and you need a legislative component, um, you know, what then? Because at that point... Yeah, it's late. It's yeah, so <laughs> we're, we're uh, going to be advising the legislature and the governor along the way, so we won't wait till the absolute last time. But we will potentially have something significant then. What we need is that engagement. So the business community needs to step up and say we demand, the parents need to demand, the taxpayers need to demand, and then when it gets a little tough, stay the course. Don't fold. So today, somebody's a real tough business person saying we're paying too much and we're not getting education. Same person the next day is talking about their sister-in-law who happens to be a teacher and complaining about something that's going on in school very well could be with validity. And then the third time they're talking about their kid who's a junior in high school spending too much time on testing. It is complicated, but it's got to be collectively that we want to be one of the best. The statement of what we want to be to me is very critical. Do you want to be the best? Do you want to be in the top five? If we are in the top five in education, and we're doing a similar exercise to all other topic on healthcare, if we can have some of the best public education, some of the best and most reasonably priced outcomes in health, we won't have to pay to recruit companies. They will come here to work. It's they will have everyone to Everyone always says it. It's about right. the education where folks are looking here. So we let's talk a little bit about these growing pains. If it's the graduation requirements, mm -hmm. if it's looking at teaching standards. Right. Um, you know, if you say you need X to graduate, and we see some schools that literally will be graduating 60, 70 percent, right. that's going to be the difficult time. And they say, whoa, right. well, how are we going to let these kids not get a yep. diploma? Is this the call to action to say everyone has to hold both students, teachers, everyone accountable and, and stick to this together? Yes, I think so. And, and accountability is a key word. I think, though, the other side of it is, though, once we figure that out, we owe it, the collective we, mm. to help them fix it. Mm. So if it's because of this or because of that, whatever the, the those that. are, <laughs> yeah, because they have a high percentage of English language learners and, and they're behind or whatever, whatever it happens to be, or they don't have adequate uh, STEM teachers or something like that. We have to help become part of the solution too. We can't just say high standards and you're on your own and see you later and you know the, the best will survive. But as we said, you know, you talked about is it increased funding or the reallocations of yeah. funds and that's yeah. what we'll see and that's yeah. what will come out of this. Yeah. Um, so again, this meeting of the stakeholder groups, you, we will uh, put the, the members out there as well, but there's community engagement during this process. Yes, we're going to have probably um, I say early spring-ish, uh, February, March, where what we will do, again, similar to Together RI, we'll pick five or six locations around the state and have an open meeting where people can come and discuss their thoughts on this long-term vision, their thoughts on what needs to be done. And, you know, those are challenging because in some schools we know we could go to, to a school and somebody says, you know, we don't have pencils and paper and that. That's not our purpose. It's very important. That's a local school issue and, and they need to deal with it. So uh, it is one of the big challenges of what do you want to be when you get there and what are our aspirations and not be a state that's an also ran, to really be what we can be, which is a great state. Our size, when we did together our I, and I think we talked about it here once, one of the findings that kept coming out was the advantage of the size of being able to touch everybody from this studio in 45 minutes. <laughs> Um, but it borders on how come we can't get our act together in this little state, and that's what we need to do. Well, as well, you know, Gary Sass has said, Saul yeah. Kaplan's been yep. there and said, I mean, the education is in a state of emergency right. at this time. Um, do you think this group addresses that state of emergency? So 
again, going back to that we were doing this group before these scores came out. But it we, was knew no the, secret. we knew bad scores. We knew bad scores before. were coming out. So we knew, is it an emergency? Yeah, I'd say it's an emergency. And everybody says, don't waste a good emergency. There's no Band-Aid, though. So nobody can go to, to the hospital and, and get a suture for that emergency. It's a, it's a little more complex than that. And, you know, um, uh, I think it was Yogi Berra says something like, you know, you, you can't get there until you know where you're going. And I think that's where we are now. I think this is a seminal moment, moment where we grow up and say, we want to be among the best, and here's what it's going to take. And then we've got the will, we've got the funding, we've got the people to get there. Well, I appreciate your taking the time to come Thank here you. into the studio. Again, as this has just been unveiled, we'll continue to follow it here. Good. But Neil Steinberg with the Round Thank you Foundation. very much, Kate. Thank you for Take coming care. in. And thank you for watching today. We appreciate your tuning in, catching Ray Rickman, Rose Weaver, and Neil Steinberg. We'll be back on Monday with Josh Fenton with Business Monday. But of course, check out golocalprov.com and find us on Facebook throughout the weekend. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel.